Welcome um, to everybody. My name is Thomas Gstetner and I'm the president of the supervisory board of the European Banking Institute. I'm very happy that today's policy conference is organized in cooperation with the ESM and in that regard, a special thanks to Rolf Strauch from the management board of the ESM. I'm also happy that um, the ECB is hosting us here. So thanks very much also Anneli uh, for hosting us here in the ECB. A special welcome to our two keynote speakers, Dominic Laborex and Anneli Tuominen and all our panelists, and I will introduce them later in a bit more detail. Today's event is about the reform of the Banking Union Crisis Management and Deposit Insurance Framework, CMDI in short. I won't introduce the proposal now, but leave this to our two keynote speakers. But allow me to take a little look back. The creation of the Banking Union in 2014 was a, was a powerful response to the financial crisis with significant progress on an EU single rule book on the establishment of a new European architecture for supervision and resolution and on reducing risks. This has contributed to making European banks more robust in businesses, investors and citizens more confident in the European financial system. When looking into the state of the European banking sector, the success of the banking union is clearly visible. NPL levels have been going down significantly, capital levels and liquidity levels have increased, and even profitability of the European banking sector has increased to levels not seen for a while. Yet, the banking union remains incomplete. Further progress is needed to allow the banking sector to fully contribute to Europe's economic resilience and sustainability. Therefore, the Eurogroup in a meeting in June 22 agreed that as an intermediate immediate step work on the banking union should focus on strengthening the common framework for bank crisis management and national deposit guarantee schemes. On that basis, in April 23, the Commission published its proposal on that framework. The main purposes of the proposal are preserving financial stability and protecting taxpayer money, shielding the real economy from the impact of a bank failure, and better protection of depositors. Let's see how these targets have been achieved and whether there are areas which can be improved. For our discussion, we have invited top speakers from the SRB, the ECB, the ESM, the EU Commission, and from academia. Let me now introduce our keynote speakers and our panelists. First of all, welcome to Dominic Laborex. Dominic is chair of the Single Resolution Board after being appointed officially by the Council on the 25th of November 22. Dominic formerly held the position of Secretary General of the French Prudential Supervisory Authority, ACPR, to which he was appointed in October 2019. Beforehand, he was from 2015 to 2019 among the founding members of the Single Resolution Board, and he chaired the EBA Resolution Committee between 15 and 2019. Before that time, Dominic was in various other positions in the ACPR and the Banque de France. Next, welcome to Anneli Tuominen. Anneli is a member of the Supervisory Board of the SSM since 2014, and since June 22 onwards as the ECB representative. Anneli worked from 1996 to 2022 in financial supervision in Finland, and her latest position, which she held for 15 years, was Director General of the Financial Supervisory Authority of Finland. Before that, Anneli worked for 10 years in the private sector in Finland and the UK for the Union Bank of Finland. Anneli is or has been member of many international fora, like the Macrobential Forum, the ESRB, ESMA, IOPA, and the EBA. Then moving on to Martin Malin, welcome also to you, Martin. Since 2014, Martin has been a director with the DG FISMA of the EU Commission, firstly responsible for financial markets and since 2016 for banks, insurance, covering regulation and prudential supervision of financial institutions, insurance and pensions, resolution and deposit guarantees. Martin started his career in the French Treasury. Then a special welcome also to Rolf Strauch, Rolf is Chief Economist and Management Board Member of the European Stability Mechanism, ESM, and the European Financial Stability Facility, EFSF, which he joined in 2010. Rolf is in charge of the Division's Economic and Market Analysis, Economic Risk Analysis, and Financial Sector and Market Analysis. Prior to his time at ESM, Rolf worked at the European Central Bank and Deutsche Bundesbank. And last but not least, welcome also to Christos Gorzos, Christos is Professor of Public Economic Law at the Law School of the University of Athens. On top 
He is the president of the academic board of the Frankfurt-based European Banking Institute, EBI. He is visiting professor at the Europa Institute at the University of Saarland and research partner at the University of Zurich. The main fields of his research, publication and teaching include international, EU and Greek monetary and financial law, central banking law and international institutional economics. So that was it with, my, with the introduction of the panelists. But I also would like to introduce um, Nicoletta Marsha, who will moderate together with me this conference. Nicoletta is head of financial sector and market analysis division within the European Stability Mechanism, ESM. And Nicoletta worked beforehand with the ECB and Banca d'Italia. So that was it from my side. And without further ado, I would hand over to Dominic for his keynote speech, which um, 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 is why do we need the CMBI reform? Dominic, thanks very much for participating again. And over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this introduction. And uh, uh, let me uh, say that it's my pleasure to be with you today uh, for this uh, event. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I will try to answer two basic questions during this uh, introductory speech. The first one is, why do we need the CMDI reform? And the second is, what else is needed to complete our toolkit? I will take uh, the resolution perspective, um, and I'm sure that a, a Annelie from the supervisory side, uh, or Martin from, uh, let's say, the the general uh, approach could complement what I will say. Uh, let me start by uh, answering this very simple question. Why do we need the CMDI proposal? Uh, well, in reality, uh, let me come back to the key uh, advantage of CMDI, which is an expansion of the scope of resolution to some regionally systemic small and medium-sized banks. This is exactly the, the, the key target of this uh, reform. Today, this bank would go to liquidation should they fail. The CMDI would bring these banks into the scope of resolution, strengthening financial stability. <clears throat> Let me come back to the past cases. In the past, we've seen that banks of this size fell between the cracks of the resolution framework in reality. Veneto Banca and Banco Popolare di Vicenza, uh, uh, the famous examples of 2017, uh, are quite illustrative uh, in that regard. We, uh, I was at that time, you, re you, you, you recalled it, uh, Thomas, in your introductory statement. Uh, at that time, I was at the supervisory board, uh, at, at the single resolution board, sorry. So we, we were confronted with uh, this question, this bank is failing, are we able to resolve them? And the answer was no, we are not in a position because the public interest assessment was set at national level or a banking union level, but not at regional level. So that means that they, there was no public interest in giving a, a, a more, a, let's say, a results, positive results via resolution compared to a liquidation. So we let the bank go to liquidation. But that meant that, meant that uh, at that time, unfortunately, um, those banks were dealt uh, with outside of the resolution with the help of liquidation aid. So at the end, the taxpayer was not protected. And in a way, our mission was not fulfilled. So that's why I think a, this uh, CMDI proposal tackled this exact, this exact uh, topic, but it brings much more. It, it, it recalls us that the use of taxpayers' money is, normally speaking, explicitly ruled out. This is already the rule of today. And in addition, obviously, resolution brings more financial stability than liquidation. For instance, when a bank uh, is failing, uh, and when we implement a resolution decision, but this bank can, normally speaking, if we follow the resolution scheme, uh, this bank can reopen after the resolution weekend. So that means that customers keep access to the full range of services. This is not the case in liquidation without uh, uh, the intervention of public aid. When a bank fails and goes to liquidation, the bank closes and there is an interruption of services during several days, months, years. Yes, there is a deposit protection, 
after seven days, some customers will receive protection for their deposits, but a part will be lost and not recovered before, again, month, uh, potentially more, and uh, the services are interrupted. So let's, let's be clear, yes, resolution can bring a better outcome than liquidation for those banks. But beware, uh, this does not mean that all banks running into trouble should go into resolution. Even after CMDI, let me be clear here, liquidation will stay relevant for most small banks. And indeed, by the same token, deposit guarantee schemes will also remain crucial to ensure that covered depositors will recoup their money in a bank liquidation. But that's true that at the same time, and this is a second part of a proposal of CMDI, if we want to reap the benefits in terms of financial stability, we need to be sure that the resolution decision is a success and it must be a success. We, we cannot start a resolution decision and then uh, uh, not finding enough funding in particular. And so that's very clear. If I have to take a decision to put a bank in resolution, I have to be certain ex ante that I have the right tools to execute this resolution. Otherwise, it's much preferable to let the bank go to liquidation. Let me be clear here. So crucially, the CMDI proposal uh, built by the Commission would also give us the right tools for the resolution of these small and mid-sized banks. In fact, it allows for the use of deposit guarantee schemes funds and possibly of a single resolution fund, by the way, to facilitate market exits, at, as it is said, if we translate that into a resolution uh, uh, vocabulary, it means uh, selling the bank to somebody else, so sale of business tool uh, or bridge bank tool in the, with a view to sell the bank a bit later. And so we can fund the sale uh, of this ailing bank uh, to a solid acquirer, either immediately or after a while, if we go for a bridge bank tool. By doing so, uh, CMD also curtails the risk that some uncovered, uncovered depositors would have to absorb losses after shoulders and emerald investors, who are obviously still and will stay the first line of defense. The recent crises have shown that imposing losses on depositors may put financial stability in jeopardy, in jeopardy because it's a question of confidence in the financial system. In addition, this reform will be low cost. Our analyses tell us that the impact of CMDI on the finances of both DGS and potentially the single resolution fund would be limited. But for very simple reasons in reality, because one, uh, MREL remains uh, the first line of defense. Once we've earmarked uh, somebody to uh, resolution, to it should become resolvable. And so becoming resolvable means MRL, uh, separability, etc. So MRL will remain the first line of defense. And the second reason is that we are speaking about relatively small size banks. So normally speaking, the impact on the DGSEs and on the single resolution fund should be limited. The expansion of the scope of resolution and the use of TGS funding which is the core of this proposal uh, and the most uh, controversial issues, by the way, should be considered interconnected and mutually necessary. Expanding the scope without the source of funding will not work. I'm extremely clear on, on, on this one. Whatever compromise legislators may find on the sensitive issues around the credit hierarchy, they should make sure it delivers the same results in terms of funding available for a resolution. So, uh, to be clear, if the legislators want to have, let's say, two-tire system instead of one single preference for all depositors, why not? But in that case, we should revisit the least cost test to be sure that uh, it unlocks sufficient funding for resolution decisions in case of a need. I don't say that there will be a need, but we need to find a solution. So let me go also to the rest of this proposal of CMDI, which is particularly uh, necessary in reality. Um, there are a lot of positive new elements that go beyond the, this core topic of expansion of the scope and funding for taking right decisions. 
So this range from a seamless exchange of information from supervisors to resolution of RTEs to rules that should help avoiding limbo situations, for instance, the, about the, the withdrawal of a banking license, as, a, as an example. So that's why uh, what I've said several times already is that the timely approval of, of, of CMDI, including all its parts, is important to send a signal of trust into the resolution framework and moreover into uh, the banking union. But CMDI is not targeting only the banking union bodies. Right? It goes beyond, it's for all the European Union members. And so that's, that's, that's true that the ultimate goal is to ensure better financial stability by resolving, if necessary, more banks. So that's uh, why it's important that the European Parliament and the Council press ahead to agree uh, and to finalize this, uh, 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 let's say, uh, to finalize an agreement. Then the question of the implementation, implementate, implementation date will be crucial and I hope we will find a short-term possibility of implementing this CMDI reform once adopted through time. Is this enough? Uh, this is my second question, and I will be much, much shorter, fortunately for you. Uh, yes uh, and no. Yes, it's a good step. No, it's not sufficient. There are other topics to be discussed and to, and to be agreed upon. Um, first, let me recall it. Uh, I think it's the right forum to mention it. On the banking union side, there is still a missing third pillar, which is called EDISC. You can call it uh, with another name if you wish. But this interconnection of the deposit guarantee schemes within the banking union is definitely necessary. So it's still missing and I'm still advocating for it. Second, uh, coming from the Swiss and American uh, recent cases of crisis, I think we, what we've seen is that the, there was an issue around the, the liquidity needs, and I would like to, to spend some uh, seconds on, on, on this topic. After eight years now, the SRB is reaching an important moment uh, because the single resolution fund will reach 1% of its target, uh, which is its target level, that's to 1% of covered deposits. So today, this represents something like uh, 70 8 billion euros, a bit less. But secondly, we are reaching the full materialization of the single resolution fund. So that means that it can be used for each and every bank within the banking union in case of a need without any national compartment. This is a great achievement, definitely, in terms of financial stability. So we are better placed than before to handle any type of crisis. But that's true that there is a missing piece which would give us an extra uh, capacity of dealing with liquidity issues. It's the ratification of the ESM treaty reform. It is still outstanding while it's vital that all countries ratify this treaty revision as soon as possible. There is only one country which is missing and I cross my fingers to hope that in the coming days uh, will be in a position to finalize this full agreement. Because if not, then the loan facility agreements will disappear beginning of 24. So it's not only we won't have a step forward, we would have a step back and it would be a real pity for us. So that means that indeed uh, we need to finalize uh, progress on the liquidity side. Another dimension I have already mentioned here and there is the lack of harmonization of insolvency laws, and I would like really to see progress here, even if it's a difficult topic. So to, to say in a nutshell, the, the, we have a strong toolkit, but it's not complete yet, and I think we can confidently continue working to improve our, our system. Let me, let me finish and let me conclude by saying that a, I think that a, what I represented here was uh, the resolution uh, way of thinking. I'm sure that uh, Annelie will give us uh, an additional perspective. But my message is essentially today to say that I would like to continue to work together to get the CMDI down and uh, to continue building a strong European resolution mechanism 
in favor of even more financial stability and even a better protection of the taxpayers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominique, for your um, opening speech. I would then move right on to Anneli, um, who's speaking about key advantages of the CMDI reform for financial stability. Thank Thanks you. very much, Anneli. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very much delighted to be speaking at today's EBI policy series on crisis management deposit insurance, CMDI. As we just heard, uh, Dominic Labworks uh, told us why we need this uh, crisis management reform. Uh, I can confirm that I very much agree with, with uh, Dominic and the, the, our thoughts very much uh, uh, are aligned. But uh, let me now give you the ECP's perspective on the significance of the current review of the CMDI framework. Implementing the CMDI proposal will increase the EU banking sector's resilience and make crisis management in the EU more efficient. Improving resilience will reduce the risk that a bank failure leads to contagion. The CMDI proposal aims to improve the way we resolve crisis situations at mid-sized banks there we have had problems in the past. But let's not forget that this is a coherent package which requires on having adequate funding in resolution. That is something that we cannot emphasize too much. I will come back to this issue later. In brief, our key objective is to maintain stability. We should not fall back on taxpayers' funds or let contagion spread across the financial markets. I will first look at some of the most relevant changes to the pre-resolution phase set out in the European Commission's CMDI package. I will then focus on how the package will ensure optionality to the crisis management toolkit. And finally, I will discuss the crucial point of resolution funding and conclude by recalling the elements that are still missing in the EU's crisis management framework. I'm also looking forward to our panel discussion later on. We do welcome the Commission's proposal to enhance the existing early intervention framework. The proposed changes will help us to swiftly adopt the necessary and most appropriate measure for any given situation. In particular, in particular, the proposal reviews the overlap between early intervention and other supervisory measures. Finally, the proposal provides a direct legal basis for the ECB's use of early intervention measures. The Commission's proposal includes changes that will further deepen the cooperation between supervisory and resolution authorities. It goes without saying that good cooperation and communication are vital. For example, when we need to act fast to prevent or address crisis situations. The ECB and the SRB already closely cooperate based on the bilateral memorandum of understanding. And if I may add, we also operate beyond that, that MOU on staff level, on sort of senior level. I would argue, I don't know whether you, Dominic, agree with me, but I would argue that our cooperation is very, very good. It is. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, under the proposal, a new early warning procedure would be activated if supervisors see a material risk or one or more of the conditions for a bank to be considered failing or likely to fail being met. In practice, the supervisory authority and the resolution authority would exchange views on measures that could prevent the failing bank from the bank from failing and react in the most appropriate way. This process would not become a precondition for a bank to be assessed as failing or likely to fail. For example, in a fast moving crisis, if the situation is severe and there are no measures that could prevent failure, we may have to immediately make a failing or likely to fail assessment. Imagine, for instance, a bank which becomes subject to sanctions 
and sees all its third-party providers walk away, thus effectively freezing its capacity to operate. In such situation, we should be able to act fast and declare the bank failing or likely to fail. And this is an incident of real life, unfortunately. Our experience has shown that some shortcomings in the current crisis management framework need to be addressed. From a supervisory perspective, we consider it very important to have a robust toolkit that ensures optionality to deal effectively with banks in distressed conditions. But what do I mean with optionality? At every point in time, the relevant authorities should be able to choose the most appropriate tool for the situation at hand amongst a range of tools and be able to effectively make use of that tool. We are glad that the Commission's proposal ensures that the various stakeholders involved in crisis management give the tools that are available to them today and we would even support their further harmonization. Let me now look at some of these important tools. First, the precautionary recapitalization tool. The Commission's proposal maintains this tool and it rightly remains subject to strict conditions. Hence, it would continue to be used only in extraordinary circumstances. The Commission's proposal includes clarifications that support the tool being deployed effectively. This matches our experience thus far. Though exceptional, the precautionary recapitalization tool is useful within the current crisis management framework and its current conditionality appears appropriate. At the same time, the discretion provided to relevant authorities to take specific circumstances into account should not be constrained. In this regard, we are concerned about some ideas out there that would constrain the recourse to what is already a very exceptional but useful safety valve. Maybe I can elaborate on this later. For example, we consider the proposed definition of solvency too stringent. An institution or entity receiving such support should be solvent at the time the measures are applied. According to the Commission's proposal, it needs to be assessed by the competent authority as not being in breach and not likely to be breach the applicable capital requirements in the next 12 months. We would prefer providing the competent authority with a little more flexibility and allow us to deem an entity solvent, also where we determine that a breach of these requirements is temporary in nature. Such flexibility would allow us to consider the specific circumstances of each case. Second, other tools built on the use of deposit guarantee schemes, such as DGS preventive measure and DGS alternative measures. In some countries, DGSs solely compensate covered deposits through ex ante payouts and then collect the proceeds during insolvency. However, the international trend points towards a growing role for DGSs going beyond this pay box function. Instead of simply paying out covered depositors, this entails using the DGS funds to facilitate transfers of assets and liabilities to an acquiring bank. In the EU, we refer to this as DGS alternative measures. We see merit in such measures as they can serve to contain upfront outlays from DCSEs, administrative costs, and the loss of asset value caused by the liquidation process. Moreover, they can improve depositor protection and help to safeguard financial stability. Therefore, making DCS alternative measures available across all member states in a harmonized way would be very useful from our perspective. These measures may be particularly relevant for smaller banks. These banks would still not fall inside the broader net of resolution, as applying the resolution framework to these banks would not be proportionate. proportionate. Still, on the subset of DGS tools, allow me to have another look 
at the pre-resolution phase and also mention DCS preventing measures. These can be used to broaden optionality at the pre-resolution phase by helping banks to ensure or restore compliance with the prudency requirements in going concern situations. I understand that using DCSs to finance preventive measures could be perceived as a rescue measure, thereby undermining market discipline. In this respect, I would like to point out that the Commission's proposal seeks to put in place adequate safeguards, for example, to ensure that these measures are used in a timely and cost-effective manner and applied consistently across member states. We encourage legislation to further harmonization and ensure a level playing field by making these preventive measures available across the EU. What about then resolution funding and the role of the DGSEs? Now I come to my third topic for today, which relates to the strengthening of funding options in the event of resolution. DCSEs can also play an important role in achieving this goal. Of course, shareholders and creditors would still remain the first line of defense. But the CMDI proposal facilitates an enhanced application of transfer tools in resolution supported by DCS interventions where needed. The contribution from DCSEs should be used to bridge the gap towards the 8% threshold of total liabilities and own funds for accessing the single resolution fund. This mechanism will ensure that all smaller and more medium-sized banks can potentially access the SRF. The Commission's proposal also includes the possibility for the DGSs to protect don't cover depositors when needed. Resolution authorities should demonstrate that the reasons for their protection have been met. Therefore, it will not be automatic. These new DTS interventions will only be possible if the protection of non-covered deposits is fully justified. We welcome the fact that using the DTS to bridge gaps that might exist is subject to strict conditionality. It means that any DTS support would only form a second line of defense and, importantly, will always result in the failing bank exiting the market. As I mentioned before, the ECB is aware of the concerns expressed regarding greater recourse to DCS funds and the SRF. These concerns are understandable, but at the same time, we need to keep in mind the important benefits the transfer strategy can offer and the many safeguards that have been included in the CMDI proposal. In this context, we also welcome the intention to further harmonize the least cost test. This test limits the amount of DCA contributions that can be used in the event of resolution and for preventive and alternative measures. Another important element to be taken into consideration is the credit hierarchy. The higher the DCM's claims rank in the credit hierarchy, the less likely it will be that the least cost test will allow for DCS preventive or alternate measures to be taken or DCS contribution to be made in the event of resolution. The current super preferred ranking of DCS claims greatly limits the availability of DCS funds for measures other than payouts. The CMDI proposal includes a single tier depositor preference, meaning that all deposits are ranked by PASU and above ordinary unsecured claims. It seeks to ensure greater harmonization of the creditor hierarchy across the union and simultaneously improve access to DTS funding. The proposal for a single tier deficit preference has raised concerns and questions from various corners. In our ECB opinion, we acknowledge these concerns and pointed at areas where further analysis could be heard. We also signaled that alternatives could be explored and consideration is indeed now being given to a two-year hierarchy. But one thing should be clear. If you move away from a single-tier deposit preference, then automatically also the ability of the DCS to contribute to crisis management measures declines. That is why we, in our opinion, stress that any alternatives should also ensure that as much funding is available under such scenarios as would be possible with a single-tier depositor preference. And to conclude, 
I would like to conclude by saying that we very much welcome the European Commission's proposal. It contains very useful steps to improve the framework to both prevent and manage land crisis. One thing that we deem crucial is to ensure optionality. In other words, policymakers should have at their disposal a solid toolkit with several tools, and they should be able to choose the most appropriate tool and have access to adequate funding to be able to use those tools. And for the latter, the capacity to actually make use of the existing safety nets, SRF and DGSE, is obviously crucial. When looking at the legislative discussions, I fear that this aspect of optionality is not always given the degree of attention that it deserves. Some want to make it more difficult for the relevant authorities to use certain tools. In the same way, the question of ensuring adequate funding is also not always given due consideration. For instance, while I understand the concerns about the proposed creative hierarchy, we should be very mindful of the impact of different hierarchy will have on the availability of funding. The risk is that we end up with a sort of capability expectations gap. With the banking union, the legislators have created the expectations and the ambition that the relevant authorities, including the SRB, will be able to resolve banks in an efficient, harmonized way without recourse to taxpayers. However, their capability to actually do this may fall short if these authorities are not given the adequate tools and adequate funding in resolution. If I may use an anal analogy, it's a bit like uh, setting up a new surgery unit in a hospital, but at the same time not giving the surgeon the right tools and forcing them to do their operations in a straitjacket. Obviously, the public health outcome would not be great. I would not be very happy to be a patient there. Lastly, we should bear in mind that the CMDA proposal does not address some of the core elements of the broader crisis management architecture. The third pillar of the banking union, a European deposit insurance scheme, is still missing. Given its importance, we hope that this will be addressed in the next legislative term. Another issue that also needs a prompt solution is the question of liquidity in resolution. As a recent March turmoil in Switzerland has shown, having proper arrangements in place for liquidity in resolution is not a nice to have. It's an indispensable part of the toolkit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anneli, for this um, um, great speech and, and the introduction to the views of the ECB on this proposal. We are now moving to our um, panel discussions. And, and in that regard, I hand over to my uh, to Nicoletta. Um, over to you, Nicoletta. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would also like to thank our keynote speakers for their very insightful remarks. And uh, I would invite uh, all attendees to post their question in, in the chat that we can address uh, later during our Q&A session. We will now start our first round of uh, panel discussion, and we will start with Martin Merlin. Martin, you are definitely best placed to outline the objective of this reform. But can you tell us uh, the constraints that you see in the ongoing negotiation and whether you can see uh, any room for adapt adaptation to find consensus? Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, very much for the invitation. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Dominique and uh, Andy for uh, uh, outlining in a very eloquent uh, way the, the added value of the CMDI uh, legislative proposal. And, and also, I would like to, to thank them for uh, the, uh, the support that uh, their institutions are giving to this project in general, even if we, we may disagree uh, on, on some details. So the, the convergence of views is indeed extremely strong. Now, um, as you know, we, we tabled the package uh, on 18 uh, April uh, uh, this year. Uh, and discussions in the Parliament and the Council have uh, uh, started in a very intensive way. And I would say that in the first instance, these discussions have allowed us to, to clarify a number of uh, misunderstandings and, 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 and misperceptions. 
it's a complex proposal. It is a wide ranging proposal. It is very new in some dimensions. So we need the time in order to explain exactly uh, what we wanted to do. So discussions have uh, progressed well, uh, both at technical level and political level under the Spanish presidency in, uh, in the council in view uh, of, a, of a balanced compromise that we, that we hope to, uh, to reach. But uh, to, be, to be transparent, it is clear that uh, member states' views are, are still quite uh, divergent on a number of topics. Um, so I can give a few examples. Um, first, the use of deposit guarantee schemes as uh, a financing mechanism for resolution. Second, the changes uh, that we propose to the uh, creditor hierarchy with now a general depositor preference. Another difficult topic is uh, how many mid-sized and smaller banks uh, should be brought uh, and will be brought uh, into the scope of, uh, of resolution. Another delicate topic uh, clearly has to do with the treatment of um, institutional protection uh, schemes. So these are examples of, uh, of, uh, of delicate topics. Uh, in our view, it is important that the negotiations continue uh, on the entire package. Um, as was said by, by Dominique, uh, if we expand resolution by modifying the public interest assessment, we need to have sufficient funding available. Uh, and therefore, we would not support any attempt to, to carve out some very political controversial topics in order to reach a swift agreement on, on the rest. Uh, we, we, we think that a, a silo approach uh, would not uh, uh, deliver uh, the intended uh, benefits from, from, from the reform. Therefore, uh, discussions should continue in particular on various funding related elements, uh, including the calibration of banks' own resources, MREL, the possibility of using part of the DGS funds to uh, support the resolution of a bank, the necessary changes to the creditor hierarchy and, and potential inclusion of indirect costs in the least cost test methodology. All these elements together will impact the funding gap and, and the ability to close this gap under the resolution, under resolution so they need to be discussed uh, together. So clearly we uh, in the commission, we, we keep promoting the uh, original objective of the proposal because uh, uh, as was said, the application of the resolution framework has been limited, um, uh, in particular in the banking union. And as a result, uh, uh, the protection of uh, taxpayers uh, has not been sufficient. Uh, and the failures of smaller and mid-sized banks were often managed outside resolution. Uh, uh, and clearly these alternative avenues involved on a number of occasions uh, public money instead of the use of industry funded safety nets. Now to, uh, to finish and to, 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 to answer your question, um, I, I think the first months of negotiations have been very useful and uh, uh, member states are getting closer to each other and uh, understand better uh, what we intended to do with the proposal. But I would not say that uh, we can uh, uh, foresee already what uh, uh, landing zones uh, could uh, could gather a consensus. Uh, this is a bit too early, um, and clearly there will need to be a, uh, the need to make uh, adaptations to the original Commission proposal in light of uh, Parliament and Member States' views. But very importantly, and this was said by Andy, uh, we will need to maintain coherence in the entire framework and agree on a text uh, which uh, allows resolution to really become a credible uh, scenario to deal with the failing bank, uh, regardless of its size and, and its business model. Preventative and alternative measures and also liquidation should remain options on the table, as Dominique said, but they should not be used in order to circumvent resolution and the use of the uh, EU resolution toolbox when resolution is the best option to, to preserve value, to minimize disruptions and uh, to protect 
the taxpayers and also to ensure a level playing field in the EU. So we really uh, want to stand firm on these objectives and we hope to, to find a, an appropriate landing zone soon. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Martin. I'm sure we will come back to this uh, question about how to bridge the funding gap and uh, to find a landing zone. But I would like uh, to invite Christos now to uh, broaden the scope of our discussion and looking beyond the CMDIE, uh, what are in your view the most urgent uh, measures that uh, we should take and where would you start from? Thank you very much, uh, dear Nicoletta. Thank you all for uh, having invited me uh, in this uh, extremely interesting panel. Uh, I think that uh, three key issues that uh, should complement uh, uh, the early, I would say, implementation of the CMDI uh, framework uh, reform, which is necessary because it contains a lot of important issues. Apart from those who were discussed, which were discussed, I would add also the new rules on the early intervention, which in my view are extremely interesting in this uh, proposal. Uh, all three of these uh, additional um, reforms have already been mentioned. Uh, allow me very briefly um, uh, to identify the key issues here. The first and uh, most uh, obvious candidate is the creation of the EDIs. Yeah. And if you ask me which I would put first, it's this one. And in my view, it is regrettable uh, that uh, we didn't go into this uh, so-called uh, parallel move towards uh, 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 improving the CMDI uh, framework and at the same time establishing the EDIs. This is an opportunity missed, and I think that um, at uh, later stage, but not too late, uh, the initiatives should uh, be taken also uh, into uh, account again. Um, let us remember that uh, during the period from the time when uh, the Commission uh, submitted its consultative document on the proposal, the legislative proposal, which was submitted in April 2023, um, the European Central Bank, the SRB, the European Parliament, had made uh, pleas for the uh, acceleration of the process for the EDIs, which has not taken place. And I don't see any uh, sign of move in that respect. A second aspect is apparently uh, the lack of harmonization of rules on um, uh, insolvency procedures. And in my view, this is also very important, but extremely difficult to implement at the same time. Uh, I'm aware of uh, some work which is being uh, by the UNIDROA currently. It's going to be finalized next year at that time uh, to create a model law yeah, on uh, bank insolvency. And um, since I participate in this exercise, I understand the difficulties in um, uh, bringing some harmonized rules, uh, even within the EU, because the differences are huge. But still, in the architecture of uh, European banking regulation, this is a missing link. And the third one is liquidity in or, if you wish, after resolution, and especially uh, when or if uh, the bail-in instrument were to be applied. And in that respect, of course, uh, the existence of the SRF, um, the fact that by the end of this year it will reach its steady state, the common backstop, which will supplement, are in my view not uh, sufficient. Uh, and uh, eventually, um, a proposal which was tabled in 2018 might be necessary to be uh, discussed again, uh, notably the creation of a Euro system resolution liquidity tool, uh, because again, in my humble view, I believe that um, it is central bank money which may be necessary uh, on the day after the resolution of uh, credit institution by application of the bail-in tool. And uh, in that respect, despite all the work that has been done, um, for example, the operational guidance of 2021 of the SRB on liquidity after resolution, all this is uh, to the correct direction, but still uh, central banking money might be necessary. And I don't think that the ELA 
uh, is uh, the appropriate tool in that respect. I can stop it here because otherwise, if I would need to develop, um, it would take me another one an hour. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christos. Uh, perfectly on time. And this allows me to move to uh, our third panelist, Rolf Strauch. So, Rolf, Dominique uh, has already mentioned the urgency of uh, the SM Treaty ratification. But let me ask uh, this question uh, How can the new ESM Treaty uh, help to achieve uh, the objective of the CMDI reform and banking union more in general? Thank you, Nicoletta. Um, indeed, the ratification of the revised ESM Treaty will be a crucial step also in completion of banking union and in strengthening the financial backbone um, of it. But before I go there, let me just make a short remark on CMDI from our perspective. I completely agree with what Dominique and Annelie said and also Martin on the importance of the legislative package, that it would help to greatly increase the agility and the predictability of the resolution framework, and that overall also improves financial stability. And as you know, the mandate of the ESM is also to safeguard financial stability in the euro area, and that is where we come in the picture. I think Dominique has also made very clear that adequate funding is a key condition for successful resolution, and that is where, he, where we come in. So the uh, ESM treaty, the revised ESM treaty foresees that the ESM becomes the common backstop to the single resolution fund. That has a number of core elements that come with it. First, it's sizable. It will basically double the resources available for resolution, bank resolution, when needed. In the current setting, there is a foreseen number of the amount available, but the mechanism is set such that that amount can be adjusted in line with the also the size of the single resolution fund. And that would be a decision to be taken by the Board of Governors, but that is indeed the intention to double up the resources. So it's a significant strengthening. The features of the strengthening is also that it is a measure of last resort in a sense that the backstop will kick in when, for different reasons, the resources of the SRF are depleted, which could be the case when various institutions are affected or very big institutions are affected. And that is when it's particularly relevant in order to have this reassurance that those resources are available. Another important feature is fiscal neutrality, which means that, indeed, in a sense also of what Martin said, that the responsibility, so to speak, or the liability is taken away from the taxpayer and also taken away from national governments. And the, the backstop will eventually be financed by the contributions from the sector. So from that perspective, it also fits into the overall framework of the banking union and what we want to achieve. It's good to know, and I would like to tell, that we have also created quite some operational certainty on this. So we have tested the framework jointly with the colleagues from the SRB. There have been dry runs in order to make sure that once the framework is ratified, we actually we are ready to deploy it and actually make it work as of day one. And that creates quite some operational certainty. So I fully agree, and also let me echo the call here that we would really wish to have the ratification of the ESM treaty as soon as possible done, and this requires still action in one member state. Having said that, let me also agree with the previous speakers need that there's further action required or further activity in order to complete banking union. And we know that EDIS would be the completing of the third pillar and would create an additional layer of financial stability safeguard in the system. And it's also clear that based on the experience of this spring, there's also need to consider further safeguards regarding the liquidity that may emerge in 
crisis situations. And we have learned this spring, it's also the fact that even smaller institutions may lead to a significant instability risk. So I think bottom line is ESM treaty ratification is crucial. It will help substantively, but more needs to be done. Thanks a lot, Rolf, and thanks uh, to all panelists uh, who help us uh, to stay on time. Um, we have not yet received a question from the audience, so I think that this can allow us to catch up <laughs> on time exactly. And uh, um, I would hand over to uh, Thomas for the second round of discussion. Thanks, Nicoletta, uh, for, for hosting the first round. Um, I would come back to Martin, and, and you mentioned already some of the points which are controversial in this proposal from the member states' perspective. If you move to the industry, maybe it's aligned, obviously, with uh, concerns from member states, but if you look at your feedback uh, you have received from the industry, um, what are the main concerns raised in that regard? And then if I can add a second question, what um, we see mitigants in a gradual implementation of some aspects of the reform um, that this could help overcome some of the hurdles um, for the approval of the legislative uh, proposal. Yes, thank you. Um, well, uh, let's face it, uh, a, few, a few topics are indeed controversial in the industry. A, a first one uh, has to do with MREL. Um, in order to, to have a, a resolution in certain cases for smaller banks, we need to make sure that uh, there is uh, MREL uh, in place as a first line of defense, and uh, uh, smaller banks uh, are worried about this, uh, particularly uh, those that do not have an active participation in the markets. Uh, so that's uh, one uh, contentious uh, point. Um, another one which I mentioned already is related to the treatment of uh, institutional protection schemes. Uh, our proposal aims to ensure that uh, DGS funds are used for preventative measures in a prudent way, uh, subject to clear rules and a harmonized least cost test. Um, IPSs will be able to continue using DGS funds to apply preventative measures uh, as long as they are really preventative and not used after the failure of a bank. Uh, that said, um, there is still uh, resistance uh, uh, on the inclusion uh, of IPSs in the proposal, and, uh, and that will uh, warrant uh, uh, more discussions going forward. Other elements which are sensitive for the industry, um, well, clearly the expansion of the scope of resolution because, uh, as I said, banks newly earmarked to resolution will have to comply with more stringent resolvability requirements. Um, on that, negotiations are progressing, and, and we made it clear that it was never our intention to make resolution the default approach for all banks, but to ensure that resolution is open to mid-sized and smaller banks uh, where this is necessary to achieve uh, the uh, resolution objectives. Um, the possibility of using DGS as, as a financing mechanism for resolution to, to bridge the access to the resolution funds is also a point of uh, concern. Um, as was said in certain cases, we think that MREL may not be sufficient and, and, and for those cases, and also where the bank uh, 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 will exit the market or will be transferred to another market player. We do think that DGSs should be allowed to contribute to reach the access condition for the resolution fund, but uh, that is also uh, uh, very much uh, debated. And finally, changing the creditor hierarchy with the creation of a single tier depositor preference is another uh, point which is discussed in the industry. Our impact assessment on that shows that we need to change the ranking of DGSs and depositors to unlock uh, the use of DGS funds in resolution. Uh, for the reform to be effective, we need a single tier. Um, this is not only important for unlocking uh, the necessary funding, a single tier depositor preference would uh, also, we think, improve resolvability and 
and financial stability. This is also aligned with uh, international best practices. Now, as I said at the beginning, on all these elements, we prefer a package approach. Um, we, we, uh, we would not favor a, a, a sort of staggered adoption of certain elements and a staggered implementation of the package. Uh, for the package to be a success, it needs to be agreed upon and implemented in a coherent way. Clearly, it takes a little bit of time, uh, but we think that uh, it is worth making this investment to make sure that uh, in the end, we have a well-articulated and coherent uh, legislation. Thank you very much, Marta, for, for these answers. So, um, not a big support for a staggered implementation, but really a package um, implementation you're supporting, yeah. But then I would move on to, to Anneli. Um, you already mentioned in your um, keynote speech, uh, precautionary recapitalization and early intervention. And, and uh, based on, on, let's say, the legal opinion from, from the ECB on, on that package, um, how do you see um, the reforms um, of these two uh, pillars of um, resolution? Um, and, and do you expect, and specifically in relation to early intervention, that you think that this will um, increase the ability of supervisors to prevent a, su a future crisis? Um, thank you for the very good question. Of course, uh, uh, you said uh, supervisors to prevent future crises. I hope that it would be that easy that when you use one tool so you can prevent a crisis. But anyway, I'll, I'll start with the precautionary recapitalization. And by the way, I want to wish a lot of uh, luck to Martin with uh, his negotiations because it's a very sort of tough, tough uh, uh, timetable and tough negotiations ahead. Indeed, we do support these precautionary recapitalization means of, that is injection of own funds into a solvent bank by the state because sometimes we th do think that it's really necessary to remedy a serious disturbance in the economy of a member state as well as to prefer, uh, preserve uh, financial stability. Of course this could happen only in exceptional cases and and uh, what we think actually is that the current conditionality is appropriate. We wouldn't have asked for more conditionality. And uh, therefore, we think that there are some elements there where which one could constrain the ability of relevant authorities to use this tool. Uh, let me take as an example the, the definition of solvency. It can be interpreted the way that even in case of uh, uh, technical or temporary breaches, the bank cannot be uh, uh, interpreted as being solvent. And uh, on the other hand, we think that uh, we think that uh, the bank can be regarded as solvent uh, where it is defined that the breach of these requirements is temporary and we need to also uh, assess the specific uh, circumstances of each case and, uh, and ask the bank to demonstrate that it has a reasonable plan uh, to, uh, to remedy and also uh, to exit uh, these uh, measures within an appropriate time frame. That we think that would be reasonable. The appropriate time frame, talk about that, so we do not think that there should be a fixed timeline for an exit strategy, because in that case, uh, it, there is, uh, from the support measure, and its automatic link is to the assessment of failure or likely to failure. So there's easily this linkage to the, uh, to the fault assessment. And we think that this could create also some uh, cliff, cliff edge uh, effects. So um, 
the one final thing that we think that is slightly too restrictive is the proposal to limit the amount of common tier, common equity tier one. But I think that these all are areas that could be solved. And as we've seen how many times the precautionary recapitalization measures have been used in the past, so based on that, I would really argue that the current conditionality is really appropriate. And regarding your second question, which I jokingly already answered whether we could prevent any crisis with our early intervention tools, let's put it this way that this uh, uh, proposal makes the, the uh, availability of the tools more flexible, we can uh, take more prompt action, and of course it helps that there is also a, a, a proper uh, legal base for our interventions. Uh, and uh, what I would also like to say that, uh, just to give uh, one very practical example, in the past, uh, the early intervention measure to remove, say, senior management or the management body was only possible if stricter or additional conditions were fulfilled and other early intervention measures taken were not sufficient to reverse this significant deterioration. So now th this type of measures, uh, uh, it's easier to take them into use. So what we think that the the um, framework, it will certainly facilitate uh, supervisory actions and also help us to prevent uh, failures as well as to intervene in crisis situations. They are a step forward. That's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anneli. Then, um, Christos, then back to you with one question that we mentioned already some of the points that um, you think are still missing or that were also mentioned by other um, speakers today, for example, harmonization of insolvency laws. But um, beyond uh, this ongoing reform and the well-known issues that, that I just mentioned, do you see any other weak spots in the CMDI framework um, that you would like to highlight here? And um, more generally, and beyond that as well, what gaps might remain in the crisis management and deposit insurance framework? That's a very good question, uh, dear Thomas. Uh, a bunch of questions. Um, if I may, um, I would uh, focus uh, more on uh, recent work which has been conducted uh, by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, uh, the Financial Stability Board, and an upcoming report of the IADI on all three of them, on the lessons learned uh, from uh, the current, uh, the recent, if you wish, um, spring turmoil. Uh, which can highlight some areas in which uh, further work can be improved globally, but apparently also at EU level. Uh, one aspect that I can um, uh, isolate is uh, um, the considerations reflected in the FSB report on uh, the pragmatic, uh, the realistic approach of the use of some instruments uh, in relation to GCBs, to globally systemically important banks, but also in general uh, to all banks. Uh, another issue which is of interest is uh, how we can improve uh, the overall operation of uh, our deposit insurance schemes, uh, including but not confined uh, to the role of the uh, pay box function. Yeah. As you know, there have already been discussions, especially in the United States, where the level of protection is even higher than in Europe. Yeah, it's $200,000 instead of €100,000 um, to further increase the level of protection. 
and uh, apparently this is not um, a straightforward exercise because you have some more hazard is, uh, issues in, uh, involved. Uh, you have the question um, of uh, the contributions that banks will have to make and the implication of that. So it's not um, it's not a straightforward um, uh, discussion, and you cannot find uh, easy solutions. Again, the public awareness uh, on the functioning of uh, deposit guarantee schemes is also very important. In that respect, I believe that um, the uh, the further elaboration of these uh, considerations in the reports of the international uh, fora will inform also some further um, reforms that could be considered in our uh, prudential framework. Yeah, because uh, in particular, the report of the Basel Committee uh, raises some uh, issues concerning uh, regulatory and supervisory uh, gaps, yeah, uh, and then in relation to the resolution framework, especially with regard to the GCIPs or the GSIIs in, uh, in the European uh, Union, and then with regard to the deposit guarantee schemes. In a nutshell, that would be my answer. Thanks very much, Christos. Then, uh, Rolf, um, maybe a few questions to you in relation to the ESM support uh, for the banking union and specifically also um, what role the ESM should take to strengthen the European resolution framework. Maybe you can elaborate, elaborate a little bit on this from, from your perspective. And if I can add one question is what are the current reflections on the ESM toolkit to strengthen financial stability? So basically around this role, what, what, what is your thinking in that regard? Thank you, Thomas. Let me say, so ESM provided substantive support to member states in the past crisis in order to help them coping with bank-related problems. Fortunately, the situation has much improved due to the development of banking union, and uh, this is really a very welcome development um, that we have to fully acknowledge and also actually to celebrate and, and to appreciate. Now, one of the lessons that we have taken from the past crisis experience that obviously it's better to be preventive than to actually only act when the problem has arisen. That means for our general toolbox, we are looking into possibilities of using the space created under the revised treaty in order to deploy the preventive possibilities of, of those tools, and that is a discussion we're having with member states. At the same time, it means also that we need to fully uh, acknowledge the insurance aspect that comes with our toolbox, the fact that they exist already help to provide market confidence. And again, I come back to the common backstop. Knowing that the common backstop is there, that the resources are available, per se, is a confidence building element. Knowing if we get there, that it is there is a confidence building element and therefore per se already helps to provide um, financial stability. Forward looking, if you would be moving into ADIS, obviously one could also imagine and it would probably be very efficient to also foresee a backstop role for ADIS or the ESM, certainly when ADIS, as some people would propose, would be administered by the SRB. Now, but let us look at the current toolbox and what ESM has and what we can do. We have two tools essentially to um, address bank-related problems, and that is direct and indirect bank recapitalization. Direct bank recapitalization was, the instrument was created, introduced in 2014, and it foresees that ESM directly provides capital for banks that is not, so to speak, channeled via a member state. Now, the agreement is that with the introduction of the common backstop, that this instrument will cease to exist. And this makes, in my view, a lot of sense. It was created before we fully deployed banking union, before we fully understood the framework, before it was clear that we would be the common backstop. And now I think the tool per se has lost also some of its efficiency. Therefore, the decision also of member states 
that this tool will be removed. Then is indirect bank recapitalization. And we actually have used this instrument in the banking related for the banking related problems in Spain in 2012, 2013. Now for that instrument, a member state must basically show that private solutions to banking problems are not available and that the public support for banks would raise by itself financial stability risks as it was effectively the case for the Spanish uh, in, in Spain in the past crisis. Per se then that instrument is there to kind of cut the doom loop um, that exists between sovereigns and banks to further disentangle it. That instrument will remain available. It's not addressed or not touched by the ESM treaty reform. Forward looking, I, I think one can think of the instrument as be remaining very useful. Anneli has talked about the precautionary recap and that could be a situation, for example, where one could also make use of this tool. Another situation is when indeed we move towards a systemic banking crisis and that we need to have broader support to a banking system than usually can be provided within the framework of a single bank resolution and other measures would be necessary. We don't foresee this, but at least it's also good to have this as an additional safeguard. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much all for this answer. I see we already have, um, we have now our first question in, in the chat from the EBA, actually from the legal department of the EBA, but let me first of all ask one last question to Dominic um, uh, before I hand over then to Nicoletta for the Q&A. Um, the SRB, Dominic, has analyzed um, the aspects of several aspects of the CMDI reform um, the, for, the, 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 the impact on funding for banks in the resolution and, and or the DGS costs. First of all, what are your key takeaways from, from this analysis? And then the second question, are there any other aspects in the proposal which from your perspective would deserve further analysis um, in terms of potential impact? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, we, we have analyzed the based on a series of assumptions uh, what the, the, the CMDI impact could be on, on a, the funding uh, systems with an S, DGSEs and, and single resolution fund. So uh, I hope that this was uh, useful for the, for the negotiations because indeed a, one thing which is difficult to, to measure is uh, how many banks will go from liquidation to resolution under the CMDI approach? Why is this difficult? Because it depends on the qualitative assessment of the impact of a systemic impact of some regional banks. And this will be conducted essentially by the national resolution authorities. I say that because in reality, for us, for the significant institutions under our direct responsibility. We have already conducted all these uh, impact assessments and we have concluded that in the vast majority of the cases, there was, there, there would be, I should say, a, a systemic impact in case of a failure of these uh, uh, significant institutions. No surprise, we are in charge of GCIBs, we are in charge of the biggest banks uh, throughout the banking union. So uh, today, out of uh, 100 banks, we have already targeted uh, your mark for resolution uh, more than 90 in reality. So for us, it's about speaking about one, two uh, plus. Uh, that's it. Uh, all the rest will come from NRAs, and it and here it's it's difficult to 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 say exactly. It will be plus uh, 30 banks, plus 50 banks. I don't know. What I know, based on our assumptions is that one, the expansion should be fairly limited in reality, because despite this qualitative assessment of a regional impact, normally speaking, we think that we have already largely covered not only the significant institutions, but also the less significant institutions. The NRAs have already earmarked for resolution near to 70 banking groups at, at, so at, a, at the national level. 
so yes indeed there are two two thousand remaining banks uh, for which uh, for the moment uh, liquidation is the preferred option but certainly as as martin has said the idea is not to move as a sort of uh, default option being resolution for all these banks so we are speaking about an increase of banks which is normally speaking limited so we've we've crafted some assumptions and based on these on the assumptions saying well, okay let's take some uh, elements to measure the and and without preempting obviously but to measure the impact of classifying more banks into resolution and we've measured that the impact on the DGSEs would be, globally speaking, not more than 15.15% uh, of a, their available means. And for the single resolution fund, uh, 2% of the, of the available means. So why such low, such low amounts? Well, for, again, as I said, uh, I already mentioned, them, uh, mentioned it to you. For two reasons. First, we are speaking about smaller banks compared to the significant institutions or the biggest dollar size already uh, earmarked for resolution. We are speaking about an additional layer, which is which is made of smaller banks than the first ones, and also because and here I, I, I can uh, come back to uh, what Martin said about the industry's reactions, uh, because we start from the idea that. Indeed, these banks will be a mark for resolution and will be in a position to be resolvable. That's to say that they will met, meet their emerald target. So we, we can discuss at length, but what we know is that if a bank uh, is a mark for resolution, it should be resolvable. And this is costly. I perfectly understand why some, why some industry representatives don't want to be a mark for resolution because they don't want to pay for their resolvability. It's less expensive to be uh, your mark for liquidation from some uh, from one angle. It creates additional uh, difficulties, obviously, but um, from the resolvability perspective, it's less expensive. So if you add the 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 the, the resolvability thing, that's to say, we will ask these banks to 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 be able to to. To, to meet their targets and the, the size they have, normally speaking, the impact should be limited. So indeed, we could have selected the more conservative, less conservative. Again, I, I don't know how many banks will go to, to, to resolution tomorrow, but what I know is that based exactly on the, on the tension between resolvability and, in, and uh, systemic impact at the end, uh, we will have some additional banks, but not so much, because nobody wants to impose to all banks resolvability. And uh, uh, while at the same time, we want to increase financial stability by putting some additional banks into uh, resolution in case of a failure. So at the end, there will be a tension, and I'm sure that at the end, the impact will be fairly limited. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, then I, I would hand over to Nicoletta, who's running the, the Q&A. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for the Q&A, and we have a question from Rafael Nebot, EBA Legal. And the question is addressed uh, to SRB and the Commission. Um, I'm reading it out loud. Uh, regardless of the political reluctances of member states and implementation difficulties, what would be your view on entrusting the SRB with all the administrative liquidation powers, uh, uh, including being the receiver along the lines of the PIC model? And the second point is about uh, uh, the creation of a trading platform for assets or portfolios from credit institutions along the line of the proposal for the MPL platform. I, I, I can briefly, briefly start on the first question to uh, make it clear that we, we have no legislative plans uh, for the foreseeable future to also give uh, liquidation uh, powers to, uh, to the SRB. We have to go step by step and uh, we want to get a resolution right in the first instance. But it is true that uh, uh, the FDIC has uh, very much uh, been a, a source of inspiration uh, for us. I think on the whole, 
the FDIC is a success uh, story. Um, uh, so we should not uh, exclude anything for, for the future. Uh, that said, uh, uh, giving also liquidation uh, powers to, uh, to the SRB would, would raise a number of uh, delicate questions. Uh, the first uh, being probably the law on uh, which uh, the SRB would uh, base itself uh, in order to uh, uh, carry out uh, liquidation or insolvency. There would need to be some harmonization or a 28 uh, regime uh, allowing uh, the SRB to do that. And, and that in itself would be a huge undertaking. So I think theoretically, uh, it is um, it is an attractive idea and maybe one for the future, uh, but uh, we we first want to get resolution right, and as we can all see, it is uh, difficult enough. Yeah, on, on that one, uh, I, I can concur with uh, with Martin. I, I think the, the the European building is is made of a, a very clear approach, in my view which is to say, okay, we have liquidation processes and uh, let's say the scrutiny of courts, the national courts uh, in Greece, in Germany, in France, in Italy, wherever. Uh, that means that uh, we, we bring uh, these extraordinary powers on top of what uh, is in place already. And if we bring, uh, if we bring the, the, these extraordinary powers and if we give them to a uh, uh, an authority, uh, uh, which is a European agency, we, we need to be sure that this European agency can deliver something better uh, than uh, the normal insolvency procedures. So that's exactly why we are focusing on resolution, which is something which is under the famous principle, no creditor worse off. That's to say, the resolution should not bring something uh, uh, of weaker than uh, the situation for the creditors and the liquidation process. And I'm not sure, frankly speaking, from a theoretical point of view, that it would be a good idea to move completely all the powers in, under the same hands, uh, because we need to, this uh, system of uh, checks and balances. And uh, a resolution, which is, uh, again, made of extraordinary powers, uh, we can decide to absorb losses without asking the willingness of the shareholders and bondholders, etc., etc. There should be some safeguards, and and to put everything under the same umbrella means a real shift in in in, in the paradigm. And, and definitely, we are not yet there for the moment. I would prefer, even if it's difficult, I repeat it, uh, and, and Christos mentioned it. By the way, I would prefer a better harmonization, not necessarily a full harmonization, but a better harmonization between the different uh, national insol insolvency frameworks for banks. I think it's important that we make progress uh, on, on that direction. On the, I, I'm not sure to have caught entirely the second question on the trading platform. No, exactly. So uh, the question was uh, if the SRB or the ECB is considering uh, to develop a trading platform with portfolios assets from credit institutions, such as uh, the ESRB ECB proposal for NPL trading platform. So uh, obviously not, because uh, the, the, the building of a resolution mechanism is not based on the sort of uh, possibility to buy uh, assets and to manage them through time. We, we are not like a some uh, stability funds created in, a, in, a, in Greece, in Spain, elsewhere. We, we are not managing a portfolio of assets. We are intervening one by one, case by case, each time a bank is failing. And we have a very short time to decide and to implement a successful decision, for instance, by selling the assets. But uh, if we decide not to sell the assets, for instance, and to implement a bail-in decision, then we have what we call the restructuring phase, during which, uh, during the several weeks after the, 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 the decision, uh, um, the, the, the managers we've appointed will be in charge of preparing the, this restructuration. This restructuration could be made of selling some assets, selling some portfolios, selling some subsidiaries. 
but it will be made under the responsibilities of the managers uh, appointed by us. We won't be in charge of implementing a sort of a platform for uh, buying, selling assets. It's, it's a completely different approach. We are managing case by case and finding the appropriate decision case by case, including when we have to sell some assets, obviously. Yes, I think that Dominic gave a very good answer. And additionally, I don't think that it really uh, would fall under our remit. Thank you. Thank you, Anneli. Um, if I'm allowed to do so, I would like to raise also one question, uh, um, if we can still use a couple of, of minutes, uh, because we have been talking about uh, this reform as uh, uh, relating not only to crisis management, but also to crisis preparedness. And we have talked a lot about the early intervention. Uh, so I was wondering whether in light of the recent crisis uh, and uh, the, again, the confirmed unpredictability of these crisis events, whether there is any other areas uh, where you see room for improvement in particular in relation to the coordination across authorities, across different jurisdictions, also in the area of uh, compliance, money laundering, uh, so not strictly prudential supervision because crisis can emerge from everywhere. Uh, let, let me start. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicoletta. Well, coordination is definitely a key word. Uh, we need more coordination than less. And when I say coordination, let me start by the beginning of coordination. Coordination between the different national resolution authorities and us within the banking union. This is one. Coordination between the different resolution authorities, between the banking union ones and the European ones. And for this, we have colleges uh, in some cases. Coordination between the EU resolution authorities and the third country wants. And for this, we have the CNGs, the crisis management groups. So this is the area of resolution. Then beyond resolution, we have obviously coordination between uh, supervision uh, and resolution. We've mentioned it already. And I think uh, uh, Anneli was completely right in saying that we are delivering an excellent uh, result in reality on a daily basis, already based on this uh, cooperation, coordination of, of our roles. What you, what you, you say is that uh, we should also be aware of risks coming from elsewhere. Uh, here, I would say, uh, again, in the checks and balances in the, in the legislation we have uh, for, for resolution, for crisis management, broad sense, I think that if the daily life is clearly for uh, supervision, so for Anneli, much more than for me. But normally speaking, indeed, we are in a position to uh, collect our, our own uh, sources of information and to uh, be able to assess if the bank is failing or likely to fail, even if uh, 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 the supervisory uh, board of the SSM would consider that it's not yet or are not the case. So we have this possibility uh, based on, on, on elements coming from elsewhere. You have mentioned money laundering, we have, you have mentioned uh, other, other reasons. So that's why uh, the, the best thing to do, and this is exactly what we are doing, instead of asking each and every regulator in somewhere, in, uh, somewhere on something to give us everything, because we would be completely swamped under information, the best thing to do is to reinforce the cooperation with the SSM, uh, which is our natural interlocutor, and to discuss with them a bit beyond the solvency ratio, the liquidity ratio, the strep outcome, and to take into account what they are doing. They are working more and more on uh, uh, the connection with uh, AML risk, uh, the connection with the insurance side, uh, the, 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 the risks coming from the non-banking financial institutions. So uh, the best thing to do is to reinforce this cooperation, this daily work with the SSM for us to be able to take this into account into our resolvability planning. Yes, and also from the supervisory point of view, so of course it uh, doesn't help uh, to, to see, view, uh, see um, risks from a sort of very narrow viewpoint we need to understand what's happening in the world 
and and also take into risks that come from outside the banking sector. If we now think of risk that have been created by the geopolitical geopolitical turmoil, uh, if we think of the AML risks and and money, money laundering risks, and then also cyber risks, which is uh, on the increase, and and we need to to be more prepared than than ever. Uh, in addition to the uh, normal supervisory cooperation that we do within the. Uh, uh, Eurozone, so of course we have very good cooperation with also other EU countries uh, here in the EU, and and then with uh, I would uh, especially I would emphasize the good contacts with the UK and US authorities, and and I find these uh, contacts extremely uh, important because when the Crisis. I don't say if when the crisis suddenly uh, comes. So we need to have established uh, relationships with those other authorities in order to be able to find solutions in difficult situations. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. I will now hand over to Thomas for the closing remarks. Thanks so much, Nicoletta, and and. My role is now to thank also all the speakers, Anneli, Dominic as our keynote speakers, to Martin, to Christos, uh, panelists, and then Rolf specifically, not only as panelists, but also as co-hosts in that sense um, of this event. Uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion, and I think it has brought, I think, quite big consensus in this group, at least, about the, the, the objectives of this CMDI reform, about points which still need to be done, um, speaking about uh, harmonization of insolvency regimes, it is, is always mentioned here as well. Um, but also Martin, I think, brought this uh, very clearly on the point in saying, okay, the landing zone for this um, approve, for this reform is not visible yet. Yeah, So that's why I see that there are some points or quite big hurdles still to be um, surpassed. So in that sense, it will be um, very interesting to see how this discussion will evolve. And, and I think the controversial points are obviously uh, quite clear already, DGS. Um, I think it's one um, point that you mentioned. The other one was which banks are to be included um, um, and then uh, harmonization of uh, insolvency regimes is obviously not part of this um, element here, but a separate topic, but obviously still still very controversial as well. So in that sense, thanks very much uh, for coming and for contributing here. Also to the audience, uh, a great thank you. And also for asking at least one question that was good. Um, uh, thanks very much and all have a good um, afternoon. Bye-bye.